Hello, welcome to Meraki Unboxed. My name is Simon Thompson, host of the show, and it is fantastic to have you back again with us once again. Uh, hopefully you had a chance to catch up with our first episode of 2021. We had some really great conversation with Holly Dowling, inspiring us to get into the new year and getting uh, into work mode, and really trying to bring our best selves to work. So I think that was a great episode. If you haven't had a chance to have a listen to that, please go back and check that one out. Hopefully you're all subscribed by now. If you're not, please do subscribe to this podcast. Use your favorite podcast app. It's super easy to do that, of course. That makes sure you get the episodes as soon as they drop, which is typically every other Wednesday. We'd love to have you come back regularly and be a, a participant as well. So I always say this on the show at the introduction, and that is please do reach out and say hello, introduce yourself, tell me what you would love to hear on the show, what you'd love us to cover, because that really is what we're trying to do, is provide a show that's much uh, use to you, value to you as we can possibly do. Now, you can find me on Twitter. I'm there uh, most days, and you can find me at Meraki Simon. That's my handle. So do reach out, and we would love to hear from you. So for today, we're going to kick off something else that we're doing that's a little bit new for 2021, and that's around uh, getting into some of the industry trends that we've been experiencing. So, of course, you're all familiar with you know, Meraki technology, and what we want to do is sort of look at how we apply that technology into the many different industry environments that we operate in and sell into. Because, of course, there are some really interesting stories that we can uncover when we start to do that. So really keen to get into that. And we're going to kick this series off with a podcast focused around the world of manufacturing. And there's so much going on in that world right now. It's experiencing so much change. So what I would love you to experience now is a, is a great conversation around that. So to take us through that, I'd like to introduce a couple of fine gentlemen from Cisco and Baraki. So Carlos, please introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, Simon. I'm uh, Carlos Rojas. As you said, I'm the Global Manufacturing Solutions Lead for Cisco, focused on manufacturing solutions and sales enablement. Fantastic. Welcome to the show, Carlos. And um, Dave, good morning. Good morning, Simon. So I'm Dave Martin. I'm engineering manager for the Western region for Meraki. I've been with Meraki for about four years, and I help lead our field manufacturing practice. Fantastic. Great to have you both with us today. Uh, all right, let's get things going on this. So for those who are new to manufacturing, you know, what does that environment typically look like? And what are some of the key criteria or terms that our listeners may be new to? Um, Carlos, why don't you kick us off with that? Yeah, sure, Simon. So coming from a manufacturing industry itself, you know, before I joined Cisco, I was actually running factories and plants and manufacturing operations. At its heart, a manufacturing environment, and it's basically a plant that has goods that are coming in in their raw state and leaving the building in a finished good state. You know, so there's some processing going on there to transform the raw material into a desirable good. And that could be anything from subcomponents for a large automobile to a small, you know, cell phone that you are using or a laptop that we're speaking over right now. The manufacturing world varies and includes food product manufacturing. So there's a lot of sub verticals in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. That's, I think that's an important term, right? Because you get into, you know, all these different sectors or sub verticals of manufacturing, including the ones I just mentioned. And, you know, there's some key care abouts and criteria and performance indicators that a manufacturing person or leader or executive care about. And I think that's important to note, right? Because we focus a lot on business outcomes for customers with our technology. Mm -hmm. And it's those, it's, it's, it's that vernacular that I think it's important for folks to get a fundamental understanding of. You don't have to be an expert, you know, but you probably should know some basic things like what they care about. They care about the safety of their employees, particularly in the time of COVID right now, right? Yeah. People are spending a lot of money to take good care of their employees and keep them safe. Uh, but they also care about the fundamentals of the goal of the factory or the plant. They care about the throughput. That is the rate at which those goods that are being transformed get out the door and into the hands of the market. But they also care about yield of the raw materials that they purchase. What is the yield or the total use of that raw material with minimal waste relative to the finished good, right? Yield is a very important measure for manufacturers. And then I can get into a couple of others too, but I wondered if uh, you had any thought around that. I think one of the other areas that was definitely interesting is around this difference between the world of IT that we're so used to at um, Cisco Meraki in particular, we're very used to speaking to that audience. 
but also this concept of OT. And I'm going to guess that that concept's pretty new for quite a few folks who are joining us today. Maybe you could just shine some light on what that looks like. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, in the world of IT, I think a lot of it revolves around protocol. There are some very common protocols. And the one most common that we are familiar with is Ethernet IP. That makes up a lot of the IT technologies for connectivity, the internet, and communications, whether that be data, voice, or video. In the OT world, it's fundamentally broken up into a variety of different protocols from a lot of different types of manufacturers. So um, you have automation protocols, you have OCPA, you have MQTT, you have all these different industrial protocols that are being used in manufacturing environments. The two worlds are coming together because Ethernet is becoming a more common protocol around the environment of manufacturing. Case in point, two years ago, I went to the, the world's largest trade show in Germany for manufacturing, and almost everything on the trade show floor had an Ethernet port for it. You know, 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. You know, you had all these proprietary protocols. Here's why it's important that we've seen this growth and pervasiveness of Ethernet ports. That enables the connectivity of these multi-protocol environments and systems into a single platform. That platform then becomes the basis for visibility into operations and data. As we all know, you know, that's the essence of being able to ascertain the situation at hand when you have data in front of you. I'm a little curious about this Ethernet. Is it actually IP that's typically running over that Ethernet or is Ethernet just used for carrying still proprietary protocols? Well, you know, David here is, is with me and he can tap into this and join as well. I'd like him to introduce himself. But generally speaking, for the most part, it's Ethernet IP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're finding, you know, these days that those proprietary protocols are becoming less common. They're there for a reason. You know, there are protocols that are real-time protocols that help maintain the safety in a manufacturing floor that you wouldn't typically see in an enterprise or a carpet space environment like a corporate office. But the trend is that these things are becoming more IP connected because we want data from those devices. And this is a trend, I mean, Carlos, would you agree that over the past decade, we've kind of seen IT and OT used to be separate organizations where IT managed, you know, the email servers, the antivirus services, and sort of all of those corporate applications. And the OT team, their world was kind of contained within the plant. And they never needed to talk. There was no reason for a plant-driven automation monitoring system to have some type of a connectivity outside the plant to an email server. It never happened, no reason for it. But these days, that type of connectivity between the OT devices connecting to the IT world is driving some of the change in the protocols, the hardware, and even that DMARC is starting to get really blurry. So now, because we want data from the plant floor to help drive business decisions, we need to get that data to the rest of the world. And we do that from sort of IT and OT coming together. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I remember this thing about a, a, some sort of term like IP is going to eat the world. It's like it, it was, it's, <laughs> it's sort of taking its time, but it's, it's still working on it, clearly. And it's good to hear. There's other terms that I haven't come across before. I think one particular was O-double-E, -E, o -E -E, And maybe you could explain what that's all about and any sort of other special terminology we typically refer to in the manufacturing world. Yeah, sure. I think this goes back to two of the three performance indicators that I already mentioned. Safety obviously is you know key, but the other two were throughput and yield. So OEE stands for overall equipment effectiveness. So manufacturers want to know how much they're getting from their assets and their investments. And OEE is the calculation that tells them that. And it's a combination of throughput, how fast something is being made, and yield, how many good ones versus bad ones are being made. And when you add all that up, you have this overall asset visibility tool, and it's a financial indicator as well uh, as it relates to, you know, the kind of investments that manufacturers would make in terms of capacity man management. Do they need to buy more equipment? Is it time to invest in a newer piece of equipment? Or, you know, are they getting the right kind of overall equipment effectiveness from their investment that they made several years past? That's what OEE stands for. Got it. 
See, we're learning stuff already here. This is great. Uh, <laughs> I want to turn attention to trends. And that's always of an interesting one, especially at the moment. We know the world is changing fundamentally for so many different industries at the moment. And I'm really curious to hear what's going on in the manufacturing world. So take us through that. Yeah. So one of the things that Cisco has built its manufacturing practice on is research in the industry. And it's absolutely key, right, to give us that direction where the market is going and what the market cares about. You know, manufacturers are currently reflecting on the impact of COVID. They reacted to the event and they're still continuing on with uh, managing the pandemic and we're still getting goods and services. You still have food, you can still go shopping, you can still buy stuff online. Even though those reserves initially got impacted, they're being replenished because manufacturing operations continue to manage them and produce. However, coming out of COVID, I think, you know, there's a lot of focus right now on this new normal. What is that new normal? In some circles, people are using this notion around that being called extreme agility, the ability to respond and react to drastic and dramatic changes to their normal environment and continue to satisfy the market. So there's a lot of focus around four major trends to help arrive at that new normal. And that is, how can the manufacturer be more sustainable? In a time of crisis or disaster or change in market demand, how can they maintain operations smoothly but still be swift and agile? Also, the trend right now is in data collection and edge compute, the ability to capture information for the purposes of doing predictive analytics and using it for artificial intelligence. Intelligence that would predict an event from possibly could happen and be able to do something about it before it happens gives the manufacturer the ability to achieve that agile environment in an extreme way. And then the other two trends that we're seeing right now are in security and automation. There's a lot of concern right now around cyber threats and cyber crime, particularly in the manufacturing environment. We see it at home. I'm sure you have seen an increase during the pandemic of all kinds of phishing emails. You know, that was very obvious. These attacks are not limited to individual consumers and users. It's also being seen in the industrial world at a much higher rate. And then, of course, automation is a major focus right now because the reality is, is that Automation can help manufacturers deal with the offset of the human factor. There is a lot more focus right now on robotics and things in the automation in the event that humans can't show up for work for whatever reason. Hmm. Everything you mentioned is really foundational to absorbing and adjusting to all this change too. So automation can come in lots of forms. It can be physical automation with robots, but we're also seeing software automation, AI being applied to analyze telemetry off the plant floor. Like for example, the ability to predict maintenance activity. Do I know that that actuator on that plant line is going to fail in the next one month to six months can drive decisions about if that plant is able to operate and meet its bottom line. So automation is key, being able to manage all of that complexity from anywhere while you know we kind of do this push pull of people at the plant versus working from home. And of course, manufacturers have it a little bit differently than most of our corporate brethren, right? In most cases, there's a demand for an on-site worker all the time. You know, I'll give you an example. So my brother is a supervisor, actually, for a large manufacturing company. And I asked him what his view was on, you know, working through this environment of COVID and having this hybrid workforce. And it's quite a struggle. It's quite a struggle when you have folks who are trying to do the traditional build and construction of product in a plant with all of your engineering architects and administration maybe working from home. And now all of these things we just talked about, connectivity, automation, visibility, security, these become even more foundational to how a manufacturing plant operates. There's already quite a lot there to unpack and a lot of very interesting conversation. It certainly shows that there are a lot of different areas of initiatives and ideas uh, coming together at this time for manufacturers. So I guess one of the biggest challenges, and we all have in our work, of course, is how on earth do we prioritize? So what, what are we seeing there, Carlos? Well, we're seeing manufacturers focus more on their entire value chain. And that is, there's a high dependency on those raw materials I was talking about earlier in order for a manufacturer to manufacture their goods as a finished product. So one of the things that was realized during COVID is that there was no information coming from the upstream supply chain. And this was a problem. And then with certain staff members leaving and working from home, there was a lack of information downstream in terms of the distribution and logistics. 
this whole sudden drop of activity caused the four walls of the manufacturing site to be almost stagnated and their hands were tied. So information is now the big focus right now in order to get information around the activity downstream and upstream of the value chain for the four walls to operate more efficiently. And then also, you know, there's a pervasive focus on securing the workers and making them safe and a big investment in personal protective equipment, otherwise known as PPE in manufacturing, just to keep the manufacturing lines going. Uh, the other priority, though, is, again, I mentioned, you know, cybersecurity, but secure collaboration. Right now, we're seeing remote workers being able to maintain operations using collaboration tools like they've never done before. And I'll let Dave chime in on that as it relates to video. One fundamental use case in manufacturing is equipment has to be maintained and serviced by third parties sometimes. And third parties are no longer allowed access into the manufacturing site for obvious reasons during the COVID period. So with technology, there's a way that those engineers and technicians can access through secure remote access in the plant into the data of those systems mm -hmm. and do diagnostics. We interviewed a maintenance technician of one of the largest equipment manufacturers in the world who had been on the job for 25 years. And he says that with this technology, he can still diagnose 90% of the issues before they happen. Now that's a huge shift. Normally someone would do what's known in the industry as a truck roll, literally drive to a site and try to fix something physically or they would fly in on an airplane. If 90% of the issues in a site can be maintained or monitored with secure remote access, that's a huge shift. But I wanna let Dave talk a little bit around degrees of safety in the workplace and how video plays a factor. You were talking about going to some of these manufacturing trade shows, which we do participate in as well with Meraki. You know, I remember a couple of years ago at like the Rockwell Automation Fair, for example, when we were there, uh, the remote expert was a bit of a new initiative. When we talked to customers, it was a bit of a pet project. You know, remote expert being what Carlos is describing here around having to do something operationally within a plant, but not having the expertise there locally. So I can pull in or I can have somebody look over my shoulder. That has gone by the wayside as far as a pet project. Now it's absolutely mandatory for the ability and for two reasons, not just COVID. One, obviously for folks being on site, that's highly restrictive for most folks. But also, right now in manufacturing, something we haven't talked about yet, is there's a common understanding of a big age disparity in the workforce for manufacturers. So there are a ton of folks, Carlos, you probably know the, the stats a bit better than, than I do, but I will say that there's a majority of really highly skilled veteran manufacturers who are starting to get closer towards retirement age. And then there's a brand new, just entering early career workforce, and there's not a lot in between. And so the need to have a remote person at your disposal to help supervise you through fixing something, bringing a plant back online, troubleshooting the production line itself. So we'd already kind of seen the remote experts. At Meraki, we have a camera, it's called the MV camera, and it's not just optics, it's also telemetry. The camera itself has the ability to identify objects, identify people. And so we started out initially seeing lots of use cases around quality control with food manufacturers using our cameras to kind of keep an eye on the process of food being made, but also component manufacturers. There's clean rooms where electrical components are being made and people in the room could contaminate the product. And so we put cameras in there. You know, there's a lot of that adoption, but I think one thing that's really interesting is now that we're in COVID, the use cases we're seeing now, like Carlos had mentioned earlier around wearing PPE, um, making sure that people along the plant line are safely spaced out. That's something our cameras have natively. So they have the ability mm. to detect people. I'm in California and we do have food manufacturing customers who are struggling with keeping the work line safe and in very close quarters. And we do that through same kind of social distancing practices, but we do it with automation and visibility through our cameras. Yeah, there's quite a lot there. I mean, Carlos, how would you sort of summarize the initiatives we've talked about there? If you add up all these new technologies and methodologies and techniques and activities and initiatives, it really puts together a better business operation environment for the manufacturer so that they can be 
more resilient and sustain their operations during times of crisis. It's what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. And achieving that, I'm using air quotes here, that extreme agility capability within their operations. As you both alluded to there, I mean, there are some really significant challenges with maintaining any kind of normality in certain settings because of what we're going through and all experiencing at the moment. And of course, with manufacturing, we need people in there in many cases. But also there is this other aspect around the technology in manufacturing, and I guess it's probably on everybody's minds who's listening, and that's this concept of robotics. And we know that that's an area where it's already obviously been in heavy use for many years in things like car manufacture and so on. Uh, so I'm sure everybody is wondering uh, when these robots are all going to take over or, uh, you know, has that already happened? What do you think? <laughs> you know, it, it, it is growing. You're, up, you're spot on, you know. I will give you a real statistic, though, right? According to the IDC, by 2023, 60% of the G2000 manufacturers are going to invest in intelligent robotics and process automation. That's their fact. It is going on, in fact, Simon. Mm -hmm. You know, in places that you wouldn't necessarily assume as well. So the term cobot is also starting to make some trends in the manufacturing space where you have robotics assisting people, not necessarily taking over a role. Um, but we do see lots of automated forklifts and warehouses. We actually did a webinar with Boston Over Robotics, which is out of mm. the East Coast, and they have robots even in a retail space. So from a local grocery store or pharmacy, robots doing overnight stock checking. But we're seeing quite a bit more of it here and there. And I would say that automation comes in lots of flavors, also comes in software. And like I was sharing earlier, we do see a lot of automation or bots happening on the software side. If we have all these disparate plants and we want more data from them, and we want them to work more efficiently, customers are leaning on automation to do that. And software automation can help drive a lot of that. Automating analysis for predictive failure, like we were talking about earlier, even to automation of like deploying network infrastructure. That's our bread and butter, right? Is that we make deployment easier and simpler which then translates into the business operating more efficiently. That's a great point, you know, and as connectivity grows, the desire to get information from more things, and there's plenty of things in a manufacturing environment, the need for automation of the networking platform for this connectivity is absolutely going to be a key to success in the future, just to be able to manage all the connected devices. The other notion I want to bring up, though, Simon, is this idea of dark plants. This is a very real thing. There is a manufacturing company called Changyin Precision Technology Company in China. And in 2017, they deployed their first dark plant. They replaced 90% of their employees. And at that time, they're down to 60, and they predicted that they were going to be down to 20 by 2020. My guess is that they've already achieved that, and they're somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 employees running this large factory. Wow. And in the same time of reducing all those employees with this investment in robotics and automation, they realized 250% productivity improvement. Now, that's worth the investment. Mm. And it's called dark plant for a reason. They literally turn off the lights. You know, the robots know what they have to do. They're all programmed. They move in a repeated motion. So there's no need for using that energy source in a manufacturing environment. What a fascinating world you're creating in my mind here. This is really interesting stuff. And of course, I mean, I keep telling myself that this is ultimately positive because we get to work on more interesting stuff and some of the more repetitive tasks that we've had to carry out since the Industrial Revolution. Some of that goes away because we've got the technology helping us increasingly. Just looking back in hindsight, you know, what was the landscape like before COVID for manufacturing technology and, and how has that changed? I, I do think of COVID as a sort of massive accelerator for so much innovation, as you touched on earlier, Carlos. So, you know, what are we seeing in the manufacturing space? Well, there is a need for more and more data. And I think that's obvious. Again, going back to my statistical cheat sheet, this is how Cisco manages its business and focuses on building technology and solutions. Data collection by 2024, 40% of original equipment manufacturers were going to use data collected from the shop floor, from the manufacturing environment for diagnostics. And their goal is to reduce their unplanned downtime by 25% using this information. None of that happens without edge compute and data collection systems. Data collection, in my view, is absolute key to managing what they have in front of them, as well as 
upstream in their value chain and downstream in their value chain. Yeah, if I kind of put it on my IT hat here from the OT side, being a customer of IT within a plant. So if I'm an OT plant operator and I want to send this data to somewhere, I'm partnering with the IT teams. Going into COVID, we saw that accelerating for the past you know, many years. At Meraki, we've seen massive growth within the Meraki industry, and it's driven by what Carlos is describing, get the data off the plant floor to be absorbed, consumed by the business and used to help drive growth. But the IT team may be new to some of this stuff. They may be new to the technology and their infrastructure, more importantly, may not be ready for something like that. So the past few years going into COVID, we saw a little bit of cloud adoption, but not much. Not as much as you would see in like a standard enterprise, you know, Office 365, a little bit here and there, and WebEx calling those kinds of things. Those were starting to show up. But of course, like you said, Simon, they really accelerated cloud adoption going into this COVID world. But pre-COVID, centralized management is really critical for our customers. As folks are trying to connect all these devices, for many customers, it becomes very apparent that their plants may all be a little different. They may have different infrastructure. They may have different sort of configurations and architecture. And so it's IT's job to figure out how to standardize that so that they can support all of those disparate sort of operations. Again, get that data off the floor and somewhere where it can help drive business and improve growth. Yeah. And just to build on that, prior to joining Cisco, I worked in manufacturing for 23 years. And I'd been at Cisco for 14 years trying to connect factories and capture this information, and even promoting the use of cloud services. And I saw a very slow adoption of cloud services in the manufacturing world, very hesitant to release their business applications from the shop floor for fear of security and cyber threats, as well as the loss of intellectual property or the threat to take their designs and intellectual property, but very slow to adopt. During COVID, I've seen more discussions and have been involved in more discussions around cloud adoption for manufacturers to be more agile than I have in 14 years. Hmm. You know, and according to, you know, another study done by Flexera regarding the state of technology spend, public cloud adoption is the second highest ranking category of spend for manufacturers than Desktops, for example, as we know, desktops and laptops are a big spend right now for people working from home. But think about that. Public cloud adoption is the second highest category of focus spend in 2021. Hmm. It's unprecedented. That's core to what we do here. So the Meraki as a cloud infrastructure platform is our expertise. And we're also having a lot more discussions with manufacturing companies around how to leverage a more flexible, a more nimble architecture that allows them to not only have people work in a hybrid mode, you know, where some are home and some are remote, but also how do they adjust in an industry that was very predictable now with so much churn? I'll give you an example. You know, there's somebody I work with that they're a global manufacturer and it's very competitive overseas in the Asian markets as far as, you know, setting up a manufacturing plant. And their ask of us was, hey, can you help us turn spinning up and acquiring a plant from a six month process to a one month or less process. And the only way you can really do that, traditional deploying on-prem systems, sending a team out to construct and build those things takes a lot of time. And that's where cloud, not just for software and email services, but cloud for network infrastructure is pretty critical. Being able to spin that up, have instant visibility, send a truck roll, like you said, Carlos, of you know field engineers to kind of put in a less complex deployment in a shorter amount of time is a huge win for manufacturers. And we're getting a lot more of those conversations these days than we did pre-COVID. Yeah, and I think it it really lends to more and more standardization for the for the plant itself. Yep. Plants are focused on those things I talked about earlier, right? Throughput, yield, worker safety, quality control. So they don't want to be worrying about network and connectivity. This allows a platform for them to be able to standardize and centrally manage all this connectivity that's needed for critical information and focus on what they're good at. That's key right there. Yep. But you know, one of the things that's critical to success over my time in working with global accounts and global customers is that IT has to come together with OT. And that is the best practices for IT have to be driven down to the shop floor and the shop floor have to adopt and share their best practices in terms of operations, this collaboration is 
what is absolutely key to success going forward. And we're starting to see more and more of it. How about you, Dave? Are you seeing the same with your clients? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, where the telemetry lands from the OT teams is complex. It could be in the cloud, it could be on-prem, and it does take a village from a corporate standpoint to bring those two worlds together to an outcome. We definitely are seeing more OT IT conversations. The OT teams are talking about reliability of network infrastructure. You look at the IT teams, they're becoming more engaged with their OT teams to understand their business, what their needs are. IT SLAs are measured in nines. OT SLAs are, for the most part, expected to be 100% at all cost. <laughs> so there's also kind of methodologies that are a little bit different, and those two worlds coming together are important to make sure that they set the right expectations for the business. I think it'd be great if you could summarize for the audience uh, some of the technologies that you've kind of listed and sprinkled out throughout our conversation. If you could summarize all those for us, you know, here, starting with safety while maintaining operations, you know, and how it relates to the Meraki portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked about safety. We've talked about visibility on the plant floor, and we've talked about connecting devices for telemetry. So from a safety perspective, we have a, a Meraki uh, vision camera that is it's more than just optics. Like I was saying earlier, it is a device that has the ability to, uh, it's got a machine learning chip on it that can identify if I see a person. Now, if I see a vehicle, it has an AI model that's built into it. And we're using that to do some pretty interesting use cases. I talked about social distancing where we can tell if a plant worker is too close to another plant worker to kind of keep them safe, but also PPE. We can do face mask detection. We're seeing some really interesting use cases around being able to tell if people are wearing the right safety gear, or even if there's somebody that may be bringing a weapon into a facility. Those are use cases that we're starting to see spring up with our cameras. From a telemetry standpoint, there's been a huge adoption in wireless. Meraki Wireless is by far probably the easiest wireless implementation anyone can do, and we can do it at scale. So we have Meraki Wireless across every sub-vertical that you had mentioned earlier, Carlos, and whether it's food manufacturing, automotive manufacturing, uh, places that you wouldn't expect sometimes a Meraki solution or a solution like ours to live, it's enabling folks to do some really impressive things. That's all around, you know, how do you get telemetry off the floor? whether we're taking inventory through Motorola handhelds or, you know, we have IoT sensors that are monitoring actuators and pieces of the plant line. You know, they're not all going to be wired. They're connecting via wireless. And so wireless a, is also critical for the augmented reality you mentioned earlier, right? For assisting yeah. those employees who are newer employees that can't rely on the aging workforce that have all the knowledge. Absolutely. The other one that we're also seeing is the plant workers are starting to be more enabled. I definitely see more tablet solutions, more mobile devices for two reasons. One, it brings the manufacturing into a world where data can help drive decisions at a plant floor and to have a digital solution versus a clipboard is highly empowering. Additionally, the workforce that's coming into the manufacturing industry these days is a bit younger and mobile is part of their world. Whereas 10 years ago, you may not be allowed to bring your phone into a plant that's not necessarily going to be the norm moving forward. And the business can leverage those mobile devices to help improve things. So, yes, wireless is, is not just a nice to have. You know, we have people roaming the plant floor doing business on wireless, aside from IoT sensors or handheld scanners, too. Last thing I would just say, visibility is pretty key. We have lots of folks who have large multi-plant, you know, they have hundreds of plants across large geographies, and they have a team of a couple of people. So, Having visibility across all the infrastructure has been really key for our manufacturing customers. Our switches have a topology view that can show absolutely everything is connected within your plant. Of course, all of our devices are in one single dashboard that makes it very easy to consume and troubleshoot and that kind of thing. You know, and the final piece is probably around security. You know, as these plants are connecting this data across more public environments, like maybe the internet, you know, across multiple WAN providers. Security is key. Carlos, you'd mentioned it earlier around the threat, security threat that manufacturers live with as far as like losing IP or intellectual property, having people leverage the plant as an attack vector. So we do have our Meraki firewall, our MX products that do SD-WAN application visibility, UTM functions, and we're seeing those as well. There's actually some pretty unique use cases we saw at some of our trade shows too, where folks are 
sending our Meraki Z3s, we normally see them in you know teleworker applications, meaning you take home this little Meraki firewall and you get corporate access just like you would do if you're in the office. We're actually seeing some of these applications flipped on their head a little bit where the third-party maintenance team, like you had mentioned earlier, Carlos, is sending these Z3s along with their production line equipment so that they have the ability to securely remotely access the systems that they're responsible for without having to do truck rolls. Okay, there's so much in there to unpack. And obviously the great thing about a podcast is you can always go back and listen again anytime you need to do that. I think one of the aspects that I just want to make sure we touch on quickly is around technology spend. Carlos, I mean, how has um, technology investments for manufacturing changed now that we're really permanently in this sort of new normal mode? Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned robotics and the numbers there. And to your point, you can go back on the podcast and hear that that's going to be a major focus. But from a technology standpoint, other than things like laptops and desktops and video systems for collaboration, the areas of spend that we see focus on is going to be the network, software as a service, and public cloud. These are the top areas of spend that our customers are probably going to be focused on, particularly in the manufacturing space using the solutions and tool sets from Meraki and Cisco at a whole to achieve that extreme agility. That's how I would summarize the overall spend. And one thing to take away, cloud spending is represented as 30% of the total IT budget, up from 25% in 2020. So watch out for the cloud. We've been telling people that for years, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to wrap things up. We've covered on so much in this podcast episode, and I have a feeling that we could do an entire series quite easily just on manufacturing alone. A lot of very interesting stuff, and it's fascinating to hear the way in which uh, we've seen the pandemic have. In some ways, we'll probably look back on this as a positive impact that it's had on a number of different industries in terms of like jolting into action some of these changes that perhaps we're moving a little slowly, but really now become an essential for moving forward. Fascinating stuff there. Thank you both very much for that conversation. And I think if you are interested in the world of manufacturing and you know your imagination has been sparked here, we've got more stories and use cases on meraki.com, our website. So definitely please go and have a look at that so you can make sure you get a good sense of the different ways in which our technology is being applied. And it's not just the Meraki products, as we've covered a number of times on the podcast. You can also find a lot of information about uh, technology partners of ours who build on our APIs to really address some of those specific solutions. And you know, Dave touched on those with face detection and mask detection. That's a great example of where that sort of technology has been put to use. So just search for manufacturing on meraki.com and you'll soon find plenty more material to keep you entertained. All right, speaking of entertaining you, this has been the Meraki Unbox podcast and we plan to do the same thing again in another couple of weeks with another topic. Again, if you want to make a contribution to the podcast and specifically any sort of areas you'd like us to focus on, please do reach out to me. Hit on Twitter at Meraki Simon. That's my handle. And I'd be super happy to either just take your idea and run with it or even have you directly on the podcast as well. That would be fantastic. Okay, so from Carlos, Dave and myself, we want to wish you a great uh, rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you back here in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye for now. Bye.